Cinema Jaw is brought to you by Swap.com. Isn't it crazy how much we pay for new brand name clothes? Why do we buy the kids new clothes if they're just going to outgrow them in a few months? Would it be great if there was a place to discover awesome discounts on gently used clothes? There is. Swap.com, the world's largest online consignment and thrift store. Stop driving to store after store and sifting through racks. Shop millions of clothes in seconds on Swap.com. Shopping at Swap.com helps prevent textile waste from polluting the environment. So do something good for the world. Hey, if something doesn't fit, hassle-free returns within 30 days, no questions asked. And Cinema Jaw listeners can use the code CPC40 for a whopping 40% off till November 30th. Plus, free shipping on your first order over 10 bucks. Check it out at swap.com, and we thank them for their support. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rai the Movie Guy, and sitting alongside us, as always, Matt, is local filmmaker Elias Rodriguez. How's it going, Jawheads? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we try to solve the mystery of how the hell Cinema Jaw has been going on for eight years. Nine. Nine? I think so, man. Eight. We started in 2009, so if my math is correct... It's a long time. Yeah, that's quite a mystery. We are doing that uh, in honor, Matt, of our top five favorite movie mysteries. I'm excited. Yes. Now, right off the bat to the Jawheads, we did do Serial Killers just recently. Yeah, in a live episode. So we did put a note out. Let's not do mysteries where they're trying to catch a serial killer. That was really our only boundaries. These are movies where the the cast is trying to solve a mystery. Right, right, right. There's plenty of good serial killer mysteries, but we left those ones off. Correct. Okay. We also have a great guest who's going to be joining us, don't we, Matt? Yes. Neil Edelstein is going to be here. He's uh, got quite a list of credits. Mulholland Drive, The Ring, our films that he produced. So some cool stuff. Can't wait to talk to Neil. I can't either. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Besides that, we have a whole lot more going on, don't we, Elias? Oh, yes, we are going eye for an eye on Murder on the Orient Express. And we have a review of Thor Ragnarok. Nice. About time. I am. That This is exciting. You see why we're doing mysteries? Murder on the Orient Express. And Thor. <laughs> yeah. And Neil, who's, you know, obviously worked on Mulholland Drive in the ring. Some mystery on these films. I think so, yeah. I think we... we picked a good topic somehow somehow some way um also since we are going eye for an eye on murder on the orient express i thought it'd be a good time for neil to take matt on in orient express cast movie trivia oh god large cast in this movie so it was easy to come up with trivia questions because there are a ton of a-list actors in the remake of the orient express also man i wanted to bring up when i was choosing what to do uh when we go eye for an eye there was another movie I was about to call some attention on. It yeah. was three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Okay. Which, uh, it looks really interesting and stars Francis McDormand. And pretty much anything Francis McDormand does, I'm going to go see. Really? Yeah. What do you mean, really? I yeah, mean, I mean she, anything she, Francis McDormand does? I mean, yeah, she is one of the best actresses working today. I mean, I mean she's, she's in, good. Yeah. I would go see it. If she's in the movie, she's a reason she's, I would go see the movie. She's a reason you'd go see a movie. Yeah, I would pay to go see Frances McDormand. I don't think so that's So what you're saying, like, she's a up. box office draw. She is, yes. I to me, she is. No way. What are you talking about? I mean, she's good. I don't, she's not a box office draw. Cinema, Cinema War. War. Oh, boy. Neil's going to have his hands full with that one. I love <laughs> Frances McDormand, so you're going down, Matt Kay. Okay, we'll see. I am Save fighting it. for Frances. Save it. Yes. It's jam-packed, and if it wasn't jam-packed enough, Matt, we promised all our listeners, that we would do a new riddle yeah. every single month. And here we are recording for the first time in November. Where the hell is this year gone? I don't know. Um, the other issue here, Matt, is that we did promise that we would get progressively harder on the riddles. So here, this is the second to last riddle. Yeah, sometimes you're, they're harder, sometimes they're not. Yes, uh, before we do get to Mixed the, results here from Rye. Before we get to the November riddle, let's close up the October riddle. Remind the jawheads what it was, Matt. The October riddle was, I have played Matt Damon's brother. I have also portrayed a famous television actor in a movie. I starred with Pierce Brosnan in a film when he was not playing James Bond. I have played a motivational speaker. I have been Jack Nicholson's neighbor. And I have played a ghost in a comedy. 
Who am I? I think it was judging off of September's riddle. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the correct answers that we got were, were way down, but we still did receive quite a bit of correct answers. I think it's the Jack Nicholson's neighbor clue. <laughs> was a giveaway, huh? Yep, yep. Yeah. Jay from Orlando wrote in, hey guys, the answer to this month's riddle is Greg Kinnear. He played Matt Damon's brother in the just awful looking Farley Brothers comedy, Stuck on You. He portrayed famous TV actor Bob Crane in Autofocus. He was in The Matador, a non-James Bond film starring Pierce Brosnan. He played a struggling, motivational speaker in the fantastic film Little Miss Sunshine. He played Jack Nicholson's neighbor in another fantastic film, As Good As It Gets, and played a ghost in the Ricky Gervais comedy Ghost Town. On a side note, I think this was the perfect difficulty level for October. A bit of a head-scratcher. I can't wait for the last few riddles of the year. Joe from Orlando. Hmm. That's interesting because Dion wrote in from East Lansing, Michigan and said, yikes, you guys, not harder. Just heard the clues and right away knew that two of the movies are autofocus and as good as it gets. I'll have to get back to you with the other movie titles, but the actor is Greg Kinnear. Yes, Dion. Yes. That's correct. So it, it was middle of the road, but we did get a little bit tougher. I, 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 th I think we did. So I'm going to reach into the hat here, Matt, and okay. pull out a winner. Winner of the October Riddle is Ryan Spatz of Morrison, Colorado. Ryan, write us feedback at cinemajaw.com. Give us your address. We will send out a prize pack. So well done, Ryan. Yeah, way to go. Thanks for playing. All right, here it is, Matt. The November Riddle. I think this is the hardest riddle I have written yet this year. <laughs> I dare the Jawheads come at me. See if you get this one correct. Matt, please. Give the Jawheads the November riddle. All right, here it is, guys. I have starred in three horror film remakes. I have played Joseph Gordon-Levitt's younger sister. I also have befriended Kira Knightley in an indie comedy. I have appeared in a superhero film and its sequel. I have been in one Martin Scorsese film and starred in a movie in which a car accident kills my family. Who am I? If you know the answer to the November riddle, write us feedback at cinemajaw.com. We will throw your name into a hat and you can win a prize pack. I want to write the December riddle. Can I call it right now? Why don't we all participate in the December riddle? Okay. The whole jaw team. Okay. Really think about it because that, right. that's going to be a head scratcher. I don't think anybody's going to get the November. I think we're just going to have crickets. So we'll see. All right. Fair enough, Ryan. All right. Got all of our, our, our duties done at the top of the show. We did. Now we get on with the fun part, right? I'm ready. Yeah, here we go. Uh, without further ado, Matt did mention that our guest had a hand in uh, creating some of our favorite films, including The Ring. And you, you guys have heard it right here. I have proclaimed Mulholland Drive, my favorite film of all time, numerous times. Uh, so it is a pleasure to welcome Neil Edelstein to Cinema Jaw. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Can you explain Mulholland Drive to me? I still can't figure it out. <laughs> I've watched it several times, right? And and it really is is actually a very sad uh, movie I, about dreams being crushed. I mean, this is I think one of the things I like about the film so much is that it is open to interpretation to some degree. But I, I think the gist of it, obviously, being this dream sequence uh, of someone who goes off to. Los Angeles, goes out to La La Land, and is having this this dream that we're first seeing of this person who has this, oh, wow, I appeared in Hollywood kind of life, and all this good stuff happens. And slowly, like we all have in dreams, reality is starting to seep into our dreams. And eventually, when she does wake up, there's this big twist here, and we realize that this is just one of a million people who make their way out to Los Angeles with the twinkle in their eye that their dream's going to come true and, and the sad reality that they, they never reach that potential. And the sad reality sitting here in 2017 in light of everything that's been going on, it's even more kind of bone crushing and yeah. sad, isn't it? Yes. But, but, uh, did, did I do a pretty good job? You did an amazing job. I just don't, uh, I'm not sure I can put the uh, dream sequences in context. I still haven't figured the movie out. So, uh, no, you did a great job yeah. and, and, it, and it's, uh, it's a special film for a lot of reasons, and I think that it's one of those movies that you continue, if you continue to look at it, which is hard to do because um, it's so complex, it, it just takes on a different flavor every time, which is what I think great cinema 
is so yeah and on that note i, I remember my initial reaction uh to this day of coming out and i saw it at the three penny over at uh lincoln avenue before it was the lincoln hall i, I don't think i've ever even heard of the three penny yes i mean this is going back some time i came out of that movie theater and i remember my exact line was I don't know what the hell that movie was about, but I loved it. Because I think there's elements in the movie, even if, if you went in and you didn't quite understand point A to point B where the movie went, you could still appreciate the craft of the film. There were elements, scenes, performances, a lot going on in that film to appreciate before you even got to the point of saying, let me watch that again and understand it on a little bit more deeper level. And the, and, and this is uh, David Lynch at his best. I mean, this is what he does. And and, and it's a testament to him as a, a, as a filmmaker and an artist. So many layers in all of his films, right? My favorite happens to be Blue Velvet from his, but oh, like Lost, Lost Highway is another one that's just a head scratcher, man. I mean, even Blue Velvet's a head scratcher. Yeah. So, so tell us, Neil, how did you get involved with... David Lynch. Sure. I moved to Los Angeles in the early 90s, uh, and it was a real fertile time for, for, for finding work because it was the music video boom. And uh, I, I moved to Los Angeles not knowing anyone and started as a PA, and, and there were so much work because uh, um, you could constantly roll through different companies and different jobs working on videos and commercials, and I happened to end up my first job was a free job, and because I worked that free job, the production coordinator's wife worked at Propaganda Films. And two days later, I got a call saying, we've got a paying job for you because you worked this freebie. And it was a propaganda film, uh, a commercial, or it may have been a music video. And then I kind of got in this rhythm with these people, and I think three or four jobs down the road was a David Lynch PSA. And then I got into that camp as a PA and uh, would, would come in and out of working with David on different stuff. And I kind of was working my way up the ladder through production. And, it, and is he an intimidating when you first meet him? Because to Lynch, me, I think of him as such a genius. Well, he, no, he's such a good guy. He's such, a, such an honest, wonderful person and a great human that he's not hard to communicate with or approach. And he's very funny. So that cl small environment of people that he works with, it's just kind of homespun fun. And he's hilarious, and he he doesn't treat anybody anything other than an equal, and that goes for everyone. I I, I, I could tell you countless stories about David engaging people on a set that uh, PAs or what have you, as though they're you know his best friends, and he didn't really know them before he showed up. And he's just one of those type type of guys. So it it for me it was easy. I was a huge fan of his, huge Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks. You know, used to watch the videotapes uh, Saturday nights. I'd video it and come home in college and watch the show. So I was a massive David Lynch fan. So it was, it was, it was uh, I don't know why I ended up in that situation. It was divine for me. Here, sure. here, here's the question I want to ask. Just dig in a little bit deeper on this because it's interesting. Like, what did you say to him as a PA? Like, how did you go well, from I, a PA to a, a producer on Mulholland Drive? Um, great question. I think the first thing I ever said to him, I remember saying, uh, where are Bobby Peru's teeth? Because <laughs> I like thought that was the most disturbing thing I'd ever seen, and I wondered if like, if if it was me, they'd be like in in case somewhere on a shelf with a little plaque that would say Bobby Peru's teeth. So I want, and he's like, man, I don't know where they are. They're somewhere. Who knows? And then we just started talking, and you just see this camaraderie. It's like people having fun, and you just kind of feather into it, and then. Um, it snowballs. It just snowballed. It was dumb luck, too, and timing, and ultimately to the point where I had worked my way up the ladder to production managing, and his, his secretary called me because his normal, his producer was out of the country for some time and said, David needs you to produce this thing. And I just said, I, I'm not ready to produce. And she said, get over here. Yeah. And I went over, and I sat with David, and he's like, you're doing this. This is easier than production managing. You're ready for it. And... Uh, that was it started produ producing commercials and music videos and and um then it just kind of evolved we were going to do this internet play which we did with davidlynch.com which is something i was interested in and then it involved evolved into a production company it kind of happened so fast and just right place right time really a lot a lot of luck and and i think for me i really dislike school i never liked the education environment so uh -huh. to get out to LA and start working was like I was in heaven I was like making $175 a day working you, on had you gone to film, film school like, 
I went to film school at the University of Arizona. Okay. Heavy on theory, weak on practical. But I was like this kid in the candy store. I was working nonstop. I was loving it. I never slept. It was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. So I just kind of just embraced it and I think tirelessly worked. And I was it was just right, right place, right time. That's all there is to it. Dumb luck. Sure. Yeah. And uh, one more question on Mulholland Drive. Does David Lynch film it in somewhat chronological order? Because the, the film was, you know... No. So complex. How, how does he go about filming that? Well, well, Mulholland Drive is a television pilot. and I've read that. And it was shot all the way up to um, the lesbian scene. The movie, the, the pilot didn't get picked up by ABC, oddly. That's a whole other journey that we can dive into, but that would take up all, many podcasts and many yeah. riddles. You we guys get, would be yeah. on riddles, <laughs> beyond riddles. And so um, it, it, it sat on a shelf, which was utterly depressing for like seven or eight months. And then financing came from a French company to complete it. And so um, there was a mapped out vision and structure that David had for what the first season would be of the show. When he knew he was finishing it as a film, he had to truncate, truncate it. it down yeah. to that last, I think it's 20 minutes maybe. I, mean, I don't remember the exact time on it. That's all new footage shot maybe a year and a half or maybe wow. 12 months after the completion. It might be a year and a half, which is crazy. That is. And then all of a sudden, it's the movie that it is. I mean, what are the odds of that happening? What TV pilot has ever been turned into a feature film? It's usually the other way around. Yeah. yeah. And, and then so critically acclaimed as well. Critically. Uh, uh, w w in, a, in a year and a half period, everyone's depressed and bummed out because no one's ever going to see this thing. And then all of a sudden, you're at the Cannes Film Festival and the movie screening and David's getting all these accolades and, and an Academy Award I mean, you know, it, it, nomination for best director. So it's it's bizarre and it's it's brilliant and it's great because uh, and I think it goes back to David's karma of who he is as a human being and how these beautiful things happen to him. Yeah, and I mean the film gave us, uh, especially American audiences, Naomi Watts, uh, who at that point was really a complete unknown. And I know I didn't know who she was, yeah. and uh, that leads us into uh, another film credit of yours. Was you were behind the production company that was with was it New Line Cinema? No, that brought in the no, ring. No, how did that all work? Uh, uh, there was a guy named Mike McCary. There is a guy named Mike McCary. He's a friend of mine uh, who, who I produce with, and uh, he was an executive at, at, at Fine Line, and he was which doesn't exist anymore. And he was responsible for traveling the globe for acquisitions and he had gone to a festival in Korea and he saw the ring and he Ringu at that time Ringu, right. Japanese movie and he had brought it into New Line Fine Line and uh, there was not a lot of interest there I mean he could tell you stories I could tell you stories about that that are just head scratchers about how they just kicked the project to the curb they weren't interested in it and McCary got laid off in the AOL of Time Warner merger 2000 he, but he and I had become buddies and he had sent me the movie for David Lynch to, to direct as a remake The Ring? Oh wow the Ring. Wow <laughs> that is interesting and, and, That's and, really and, interesting and, and I had watched this film and I was terrified I remember I was living in this house in Westwood and I watched it and I'm like this is were you by really yourself? Good. I was by myself. Yeah, that's creepy. <laughs> and I went in the next day and I said, David, I watched this amazing film called Ringu. It's a Japanese horror film. Would you be interested in remaking? And he said, nah, that's not that's not going to be for me. And so a, a year passed, and when Mulholland Drive was done, I kind of knew that David wasn't going to make something for a while, and it was time for me to kind of go to other pastures. And McCary calls me that week and says, hey, I got fired. I've got six months to sell the ring. They don't want it here. Uh, the Japanese company's giving me the rights to sell for six months. Will you produce it with me? Because I don't have the physical production experience you have. Maybe you'll bolst bolster the package. I said, are you kidding me? I love that thing. So he and I packaged it and then ultimately sold it. And that's a book. <laughs> I'm the, sure. The nonsense of the ring not being sold, sold, and everything in the making of it. And I would then, read that book, man. You got to <laughs> write it. It might be a documentary too, but I'm too close to it. And there's still there are still simmering feuds and anger over it, and people that claim that they there were lawsuits by people that claim it. it's crazy. But we started going down a list at DreamWorks of actresses, and I was like, we Naomi Watts. They're like, well, who the hell is she? And I said, well, I'll set up a screening of Mulholland Drive, and no one <laughs> came but Gore Verbinski. And Gore saw it and he goes, that's it, I want her. 
And they kept going down the list, and the head of the studio wouldn't really pay attention to Mulholland Drive. And I think at some point, Gore pulled rank and went to Steven Spielberg and just said, this is what I want. I'm not dealing with these lists anymore. And that's how Naomi Watts got the part wow. in the ring. Yes. Yeah. So who, what studio actually bought it then? DreamWorks? Is DreamWorks bought saying? it. Okay. Uh, Disney was interested. And uh, I'd say 18 other studios passed. Everybody passed. DreamWorks had initially passed. And Disney wanted it. And so every studio passed. It was crazy. I mean, this is, they pass on everything. They Imagine pass. if Disney had made the ring, you know? I mean, they, it, it would have been so heavy It would have been under the, what is that label that I always forget that they always revive and disappears with the Sphinx. And, uh, and I made another movie under that label. Let's throw it in the jaw box. Yeah, I, yeah, I know yeah. what you're talking uh, about. Yeah. Yeah. Not Hollywood pictures, maybe. Um, if we can't okay. think of a fact, yeah. we throw it in the yeah, jaw yeah, box yeah. and yeah. Elias it looks in. it up. Yeah. It's a beautiful logo. But um, the ring... There was, there was an executive there named Jeff Clifford who loved it. He was a great guy. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been okay, but the key to the ring was Gore Verbinski. I mean, sure. and he, was, he had a cushy situation at DreamWorks because he was like a Spielberg prodigy. He was all, you know, when these movies work, it's because of the director, mm -hmm. and he nailed it. And the producer. Uh, let's not nah, kid ourselves, I Neil. Mean, <laughs> to some degree, but really the execution it lays at the feet of the director and if the producers have to get involved later in the process you got big problems well well one thing that that um you're sort of credited with is the the famous marketing surrounding the ring which i mean the the film stands alone but you, you can't talk about the oh. ring without talking about that viral marketing campaign with the the cursed video that that went around so yeah. i, I want to ask a little bit about sure. that like how I did you remember. conceive it how did you launch it that kind it, of thing there was DreamWorks, there was a resistance. I think, I think there, was, there was a woman at DreamWorks who was a head of distribution named Terry Press. And, the, you know, if you're a producer and distribution people really don't want to hear from anybody but the head of the studio. So people like the director or producers, they don't really give a flying F what you think or what you have to say because that's their domain. And, and that's a good thing, too. I think it's good conflict. But you got to fight and challenge people. We, myself and Mike McCary and Gore, approached this company called Buzztone. A woman named Liz Heller ran it. She was really good at doing viral marketing things. She was radically off the scales doing cool stuff. And we went to her and we conceived of this idea. And I think there wasn't an appetite for it. And then again, Gore, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, found a way to get the money to, to launch this viral the viral video sure thing, which is that, a no-brainer though i mean the four of us could sit here and come up with that based <laughs> on a you know what i mean really but to execute it was huge and the, and the studio they thought it was a loser they never thought the movie would take off the way it did and so, that thing made a ton of money i mean that was it also it made huge. a ton of money and if you look at the box office it kind of went up and just kept going up and then it plateaued but it was at the height of the dvd boom yeah. so the dvd sales on that movie i'm sure were mega. astronomical sure yeah. and the huge tragedy is is that we didn't make a sequel for years and then we made a third one that came out last year so dreamworks has this franchise which every studio needs horror franchises because right. it's bread and butter and they don't know how to keep churning them out i mean you can't be precious with these things at a certain point yeah you know mm -hmm. it's a business mm -hmm. and so that's been an odd thing and now it's been consumed by paramount now are, are you allowed to be uh, to watch the ring and, and be scared like we all were yeah. I mean, do I allow myself yeah. to? Yeah. Because yeah, we were yeah. all freaked out. We've all talked yeah. about how scary the ring is. I, I, I saw her face. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I, I think, I recall I was pretty frightened, but I, you know, sometimes it's hard to be frightened. Yeah. Because well, you're so close wondering. to it. You're exactly. like, yeah, you're, That's yeah. Why you're there on set. You're you see seeing, the props. Yeah, you're seeing the whole deal. But still, when it all synthesizes and <clears throat> the scores laid in and all these beautiful things and you see the end product, it's... Yeah. Now you mentioned it took a while to get to the sequel. Was there a reason why it took a, re a long time? Is there a story behind that? Because it, it seemed like it, it, it should have, you're right, when it, a, a successful should horror movie comes out. Yeah. yeah, I think um, this is my perspective. I think there was a lot of, uh, we're DreamWorks and um, we got lots of money and we're rich people and why do we need to rush to, to make this? And that, that may be too simplistic, but I, I don't think that studio was set up in a way to maximize 
something like that. Take advantage of something that's a major franchise, mm-hmm. and, and it's been written about. And I just think it was the structure of how that studio was run, mm. um, which is easy to me for me to Monday morning quarterback. But yeah. if you look at all the movies they made, it's not overly impressive. It's not a lot. And the one thing that crushed out of the ballpark that is a franchise was the ring. Sure. And it huge missed opportunity. Yeah. Now, when all this is going down, were you living, because you, you live here in, in Chicago I live here now. now. I just, I moved back here recently. Okay. So uh, at that time you were living oh, yeah, out yeah. in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, I moved back two years ago. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering. Welcome back. <laughs> Chicago like missed you. a long you. homecoming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love it. Yeah. Thank you. You get to do Welcome. fun things like Cinema John now. I love it. <laughs> you saw the Cubs win and now you're here for well, Cinema John. fan. Uh, uh, yeah. So is, so is uh, Rob. I'm a big Sox yeah, fan as well. Yeah, yeah. I saw the Yankees hat you got yeah, on there. Yeah, so. I don't like the Yankees either. <laughs> I was in Canada, and I went to a sporting goods store, and it was either Blue Jays hat or Yankees. And I had to go Yankees. I'm not you chose correctly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Um, now, can you also talk about haunting Melissa? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, so in... T- when this first, is an interesting project. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, when I first got an iPad, I sat with it, which was 2011, and I was like, holy... I would swear if, if this wasn't a family show. <laughs> this is a window. I've, I, I can deliver pe- things directly to people, which is stuff that David Lynch and I were talking about in 1999. Like, let's circumvent the system and go right to people. But the, the pipe was, you know, dial up. But when I got the iPad, I'm like, this is it. And I thought, I'm, I want to make a ghost story that I want to deliver to people under their mobile devices. And um, I didn't know anything about the technology, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to direct this thing. And then I just kind of went about figuring out how to raise money. And it was easier to do than anything I'd ever had tried before because it was an app and it was technology. And the app store was taken off and I raised the money like this. And then the next thing I know, I was in Canada making the first app. I learned a lot about the technology. And, and Haunting Melissa was always about leveraging the technology to not fit into conformity, meaning An episode could be two minutes. The next episode could come an hour later and be 20 minutes. The next episode could come four days later and be five minutes. That's the beauty of it. And the beauty of it was is that what I learned is through the app technology and software coding and building a CMS, which is a tricky word that I never knew what the hell that meant, and I think I do now, content Content management management system, system. you can manipulate all these levers. I could create these different cohorts of users and A, B, test schedule and price point. And then I started going, wow, maybe I can do editing in real time. So if you watch a clip and you go back, it changes. And then if you go back and watch again, it changes again. So in the CMS, I built these switches. So I shot things multiple ways. That's part of the thing I've a patent on, mm-hmm. um, and I realize that patents don't mean anything unless you kind of enforce them, and I don't understand any of it, and it's a <laughs> lot of lawyers on a phone, and I, my brain just goes into overdrive. So I, I'm like, what the? But but Haunting Melissa was this little experiment. So I shot it as a found footage film in Canada. I kind of wanted to box myself in in Alberta, Canada, and I hired all Canadian cast and crew, and then I made it for next to nothing, I think. And then uh, Apple heard about it. And they got really jazzed up, and I went to sit with them, and they helped us kind of launch the first one. They really helped us fine-tune things. And then um, that did really well, and then the guy that wrote the check said, do a sequel. I said, well, if I'm doing a sequel, it's going to be like a feature, and I need a few million bucks. He said, whatever, go do it. I mean, I love wow, this guy. nice. And so I went back to Canada. Uh, this is like in a three-year span, and I shot the sequel, which, again, uh, uh, was oh, so much fun to make. Are you writing this too? No, uh, Andrew Claven wrote it. Andrew okay. Claven is this great mystery horror writer who I met years ago. I sold some horror scripts with him. And uh, he's a kind of an expert, not kind of, he's an expert in uh, traditional ghost stories. Like every ghost story ever written, he's read. And he's like, he's a genius about this stuff. So I went to him with this idea and he wrote it. We mapped it out together and worked on it. Sure. And then I went back to Canada and shot the sequel, which was not found footage. And um, I, I'm pretty proud of what we did. It was an unbelievable crew up there, unbelievable cast. And then the technology, I did it all in L.A. and finished in L.A. So it's making a movie, but you're you're controlling the distribution mechanism and building the window and the machine. And that was a, an awesome experience. I just... Uh, 
you need to scale it. It's like Netflix, but the app is the experience. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the environment. I, I, I want to just check stylize this it. Out. I mean, it's, it's not up anymore. Oh, no? We yanked it because it's just the burn rate of keeping things in the store. Yeah. But the app was pretty bad ASS. I think. Yeah. yeah. Bad -ass. You can say bad -ass. You can say bad -ass. Um, Because we, I had these designers, such creative, wonderful people around me, and we just, we just went for it. And um, I'm proud of what we did. But that gave me the thirst to start directing. So, sure. and, and, and it, I learned so much. It was, it's awesome. Fun. That's great. Yeah. That is yeah. really great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's, what's next? What can we expect? Uh, well, um, from Neil? I, you know, I've always got a slate of movies that are set up at the studios and things I want to make. I'm putting together a feature that I'll shoot here in January and I'll, I'll, I'll shoot it all here. Um, that's a bit of a, a thriller. I call it a character thriller. I'm producing and directing it. I wrote the, it's the first script I've written. So that is just this close to happening if not it's kind of happening i just don't want to curse it and get into the details and then i'm working on some tv for here and other features i've got a you know i'm always got at the itch how are we doing as a film town chicago since you've Great come question. back um listen it's hard for me to critique i think that there's a lot of good stuff happening here from my simple perspective there's a lot of tv stuff it's not necessarily some of the things i would watch but um you know yeah, I don't watch uh, a lot of TV, but, period. But, but, um, but there's but a there's lot of work. work. There's a lot of work. That's the most important thing. I think there's a thirst, and people are aware that it's a booming business now. And with streaming media, I mean, I think it's going to be all upshot for Chicago. I just like to see people... I'm worried about people not going to movie theaters anymore. As much as I love streaming, I want there to be everything. I want movie theaters to stay in existence. And I hope that there, there's like a film community here, people who are going to make great things that are going to do really well. I mean, I love art house movies, but mm -hmm. I also think it's a business. You got to make some stuff that, you know, works. Sell, sell yeah. some tickets. So, so I think Chicago's in great shape, and I see a lot of positive effort from the, the people that control the levers in government at, at the local and, and higher up. I'm really impressed with the hustle. So, you know, I got to make a movie here to really dig into it, but that's just my simple perspective. It's hard sure. for me to, to really critique anything. But Awesome. Yeah. Good to hear. Yeah. That's a good report card. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think what I'm most excited about, Matt, is when we decide to make Cinema Jaw the movie, mm -hmm. we, we got the best producer you could possibly have, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> yeah. And Humble. Yeah, I'd help yeah. any way I can. Uh, now, Neil, we like to end all of our guest interviews with some silly cinema cues, we call them. Get to know the guests through the eye of the lens. Elias, you got something for Neil? Yes, Neil. So you mentioned that early on you worked on a David Lynch PSA. If you had to make your own PSA, what would it be about? Oh, boy. Let me describe it for the jawheads. Neil's head is down. If I had to make my own PSA, what would it be? He is about? thinking. I mean, we're living in a world now where I don't know if I can answer that question without getting railroaded or something. <laughs> uh, These are silly cinema cues. That's, yeah, that's, that's true. What would it be about? Um, I can't. I, 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 I wouldn't even know where to start. Well, this kind of leads into my next question. Yeah. So I, I we might could, come back to yeah, that. Okay. So you said uh, that a lot of these stories could be in a book. What uh, would your title of your tell-all book in the future be named? Uh, my tell-all book about Hollywood? <laughs> yeah, of all these stories that you have built up. <laughs> Just the title of the book. Yeah. Um, You can tell my creative, my creative brain <laughs> These is. These are deep. Spotted. They're supposed to be <laughs> silly. <laughs> I know. Heavy. I don't we know, gotta maybe, change uh, the segment. I met Harvey Weinstein on an elevator in Cannes. <laughs> hey, that's, that's a great a title. Yeah. I mean, there's gonna be a lot to tell. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. if I saw that on a bookshelf, yeah. I'm probably purchasing Harvey it right now. Harvey and me. <laughs> um, See, he knows how yeah. to sell tickets. He no, knows how to sell we books. Get, we'll, we'll get, we'll get back to that one too. Yeah. What would the title be? Ooh, these are tough. <laughs> I'm gonna have to tweet these out later. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Good stuff. Um, for the jawheads, we call them, the listeners, uh, if they want to follow you, uh, see what you're up to, social media-wise, where, where are you at and where can I, people I, follow I'm you? I'm on Twitter. I go in aggressive spurts, solely focusing on movie and entertainment stuff. Um, sometimes I'm on there, but n not as much. And what's your waves. And Instagram, I fiddle around with some photography stuff. And what's your handle? Yeah, what's your handle? Yeah. My name, Neil Edelstein, N-E-A-L. Edelstein, E D E L S T E I N. And we'll awesome. link to it too. Yeah, 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 for sure. Awesome. So Neil is sitting in on this entire job. He has his top five mystery movies. Mystery movies. I like it. Uh, brings us to Eye for an Eye, Elias. Yes, Eye for an Eye. Interested or ignore? Murder on the Orient Express. A lavish train ride unfolds into a stylish and suspenseful mystery. 
From the novel by Agatha Christie, Murder on the Orient Express tells of 13 stranded strangers and one man's race to solve the puzzle before the murderer strikes again. The film stars Johnny Depp, Michelle Pfeiffer, Judi Dench, Penelope Cruz, Daisy Ridley, Willem Dafoe, and Kenneth Branagh, who also directed the film. His last two directed films were the live-action Cinderella and the first Thor movie. We throw it over to Rai, interested or ignore. I'm really excited, actually, about this movie. And part of the reason, Matt, is because I have never seen the original Murder on the Orient Express. And as much as I usually bash remakes on Cinema Jaw, sometimes the one good thing, a positive that a remake can do is put the spotlight on the original. I do want to actually make sure I catch the original before I go see this remake. So I am interested in the Orient Express. Matt? I think I've seen the original. And I was actually looking it up. Um, it's really, is this Hitchcock? Am I like? No, it's no? not Hitchcock. Okay. So who, it's from the hey, 30s, right? Oh, the, the, the original going way way back yeah, yeah. throw it in the jaw box yeah. okay doesn't matter i'm pretty sure maybe when i was a kid my mom's a huge agatha christie fan yeah i'm interested in murder on the orient express hell yeah neil interested or ignore? absolutely i think it looks very sexy and and like hipped up in a way that you go wow i want to see that film the yeah. trailer's amazing. And every once in a while, I'm shocked when, when a good mystery film comes out, right? It feels like just watching the trailer, it's like, ooh, we haven't had one of these in a while. I'm excited for it. Yeah, it, 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 it's kind of like horror. Like, why would horror ever go away? And why isn't mystery like a... I mean, horror is mystery to some mm -hmm. degree, but there should be an endless amount of, of mystery films. They're I the agree. best. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like Westerns. Like, uh, yeah. we, uh, we make it a four for four? We are. When I first uh, saw this, uh, though, uh, and I saw Johnny Depp and Michelle Pfeiffer, I was thinking Dark Shadows 2, and I wasn't going to go for it. But, uh, yeah, no, the rest uh, sounds pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty pretty pumped for it. Maybe we'll get a review out for the Jawheads, Matt. I think we should. Yeah. Four Interesteds for Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, speaking of new movies, Matt, after being disappointed with Thor 2, Marvel pushed the boundary for Thor Ragnarok. They hired... Taika Watiti, and they did not stop there, casting heavyweight actress Kate Blanchett and the always fun Jeff Goldblum. Did their math add up to a surefire success? Matt and I crossed the Bifrost Bridge to check out the latest installment. Hello, the goddess of death has invaded Asgard. Oh, I've missed this. And you and I had a fight recently. Did I win? No, I won easily. Doesn't sound right. Well, it's true. Asgard is dead. And it'll be reborn in my image. I thought you'd be glad to see me. I need to stop her here and now. To prevent Ragnarok, the end of everything. So I'm putting together a team. Like the old days. Surprise! This will be such fun. Thor Ragnarok picks up with Thor in some major trouble. Chained, caged, and trapped down inside some lair that is filled with fire. Thor, talking to a skeleton for the audience's benefit, explains how he got in said predicament. This opening sequence supplies action, yes, but also some humor. It sets the tone for what we are about to see. The overall plot of Thor Ragnarok is very basic. Thor's dad Odin is dying, and with his death, Ragnarok begins. Hela, played by Kate Blanchett, has been imprisoned for years, but with the death of Odin, she is free to have her revenge. Hela is not a random villain, but I don't want to give away her relationship in case there are some out there that have not seen this film. She plans to find her way back to Asgard and claim her throne. Along her way there, she fights Thor and Loki and casts them off onto a strange planet run by the Grandmaster, played by Jeff Goldblum. Here, Thor runs into Hulk, some fun action, more humor ensues. Eventually, they convince Hulk and Valkyrie, who they also meet there, to do the right thing, go back to Asgard, and defeat Hela. That's the plot in a nutshell. 
All right, Matt, we spoke about tone just last week when discussing Suburbicon. In that case, they got it completely wrong. For what they are going for here in Thor, they nailed it. There are some genuinely funny moments in Thor. The action, meanwhile, like all Marvel films, is done in a spectacular fashion. The characters, while none are very complex, are fun and easy to root for, with the exception of Kate Blanchett. They got one of the greatest living actresses working today and gave her almost nothing to do in the film. However, my biggest gripe, what I found missing, Matt, if you will, was the weight. The story presents zero weight, and I mean that in regards to what is at risk here? I have argued before that I felt that these superhero movies do not present much drama when it comes to who lives or who dies or what blows up, but Thor did not even try to connect in this field. One of the issues is the final battle takes place on Asgard, a world I never felt was real, a world I have never had feelings for. I do want to talk about the music for a second, Matt. I found it jolting to have rock songs playing at times in this film. As cool of a scene as it is, when they're fighting on that Rainbow Road track from Mario Kart while the immigrant song from Led Zeppelin plays, I was also taken out of the moment for a bit. This felt more like a thrill ride than it did a movie at points. Matt, do you agree with any of my criticisms or are you fully on board with Thor Ragnarok? I am fully on board for <laughs> Thor Ragnarok. Go figure. Go figure. I, listen, you, you said something really intelligent on Slack. I'm which, gonna get to that. Okay. I'm gonna get to that. All right, good. I wanna get to that. Uh, first, I, I'm, I'm gonna go sort of in reverse order here. Uh, Led Zeppelin, I don't even like Led Zeppelin. There, I what? said it. I said oh it, okay? Oh my God, get I'm him not out a of fan. the room. <laughs> Stones, Beatles, fine. Zeppelin, not so much for me, okay? Uh, but the Immigrant Song, I, you gotta love that one, you know? And it's perfectly placed. That's what that song is about. It's about Norse it, Hammer of the Gods. It's about that sort of like battle. I get it, I get it. But, uh, go it on fit, with your It fit, like plans. old heavy metal was about the Thor, like the stuff you spray paint on the side of a van. I mean, it was fit perfectly, Ryan, so you're dead wrong on that. Uh, what were you saying, the tone, the campiness? The, this no, guy, I'm gonna get to the campiness. Okay, okay. So, okay. The, the humor, you, you glossed over the best part of the movie. So they're, they're left stranded on this uh, uh, planet, they run into Jeff Goldblum and the Hulk. That's how you really got from point A to point B. <laughs> that is the heart of this movie. It's awesome. The action isn't supposed to have that much gravity. It's a comic book movie, dude. Wow. <laughs> what a tone shift all of a sudden. But you Sometimes comic book movies can be serious. You have cried and cried that people <laughs> need to take these movies more serious. Why can't they be serious and be superhero movies? And now the words right out of your mouth are, it doesn't have to be serious. It's a superhero movie. Bite your tongue, Matt Kay. No, no. It's, I won't bite my tongue because sometimes you need to be subversive, right? And this is what Marvel is so genius. They they set it up and they they grounded it in realism. The only one who's done it better, I think, is is the Batman films from Nolan, as far as setting uh, a superhero world in reality. Yes. So, but then they have to subvert it because their competition DC is coming in and trying to get dark and gritty and like like really ugly, and they're like, no, we're going to turn up the fun even more, and people are loving it. Well, all right, so that brings us to the, the campiness. And my problem, what I was saying was no weight was my main thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there really is, and I've complained about this in numerous superhero films, that there's never anybody in peril. There's never a, a time where you thought any one of the characters in the Thor movie was going to die. Not even close. Nothing. They don't even give you the ramification if it could happen. So literally when they go into this big epic battle at the end, Nobody cares about what is at stake. There's nothing at stake. In the movie, yes, you know, I don't want to give everything away. There's like something presented, but I'm saying there's nothing invested from an audience member that there's something at stake on screen. You're just watching it as like it's candy on screen. This is a fun two hours. But at the end of the day, nothing hits you inside the core, like say the Dark Knight. For instance, I'm saying they're on completely different levels. This but is we just didn't, a Batman pop wasn't ride. gonna die. This, this is a pop. No, I think I did. Yes, I mean, how about especially even in Dark Knight Rises when his back is broken? I mean, there's definitely. And we saw that coming because that's in from the comic book. I don't read comic books. 
I, you lost me. You think I'm okay? The question would be: Do you agree? There's there's really little weight to Thor. It's really just what I would call a pop ride of a movie. Yeah. Okay. Did you laugh? Yeah, I laughed. But I mean, yeah, I laughed, and it's one of those movies. I think probably it, six months it, from now, I'll more or less have forgotten. Is it gonna? It's not supposed to be a movie that changes your life. I mean, wow! The, I can't believe the tone this guy takes. It's a comedy, <laughs> right? It's a comedy. Okay, so it's a comedy. Yes. Straight out comedy. Straight up comedy. Okay. All right. So the question was on Slack that you said I had said something intelligent was. It's, for it the happens longest occasionally. Time, wow. For the longest time, uh, Matt Kay, and I'm sure there's listeners out there that love their comic book movies. I'm not the biggest comic book fan. <laughs> they have complained constantly that they needed more serious, that they're sick of and tired of everything coming out just being, and their, their word is in quotes, campy. They don't want it to be campy. They want people to take it serious. These are serious stories. If you watch Thor, and right now it's like Marvel's winking with the audience, so we feel right now this is like the cool hip movie, but you give this about five years, and this is wholeheartedly a camp fest. This is as campy of a movie as it gets, and I ask you, Matt, A, is that true, and B, why is it acceptable now? When it's made by people who are in on the joke, meaning they treat the material, they approach the material with love, then the campiness is, is genuine, it's heartfelt, and it's, it's laughing along with the source material. Whereas when you get uh, you know, the bat nipple debacle from the Joel Schumacher Batman, which was campy as all hell, but completely unintentionally, then it's a disaster. I mean, cardboard sets, it just, it falls apart. There's no love. It wasn't done with care. It wasn't done with love. And I agree. It's a delicate balance because if they go too far down this road, then it's just going to be silly. And you're right. It won't have any weight whatsoever. I, but I there already has to think be... we're there uh, is what I guess what I'm saying. I already, as a viewer, not being into the comic book fans, uh, movies, I would already say that's where I'm at. I'm like, well, they've, they've already gone back to what all these fans were rallying against in my opinion i thought it was campy there was no weight to the movie it was just silly i had fun with it don't get but me here's wrong. the thing ryan you're wrong because i you know to take a page out of what neil said earlier his book uh it's a business right and they saw that they had a hit in guardians of the galaxy and that's what audiences responded to and what audiences liked so they didn't respond to the first two thor movies they failed i mean they're they're probably the bottom of the barrel of the marvel movies so they changed the tone and all of a sudden it's their biggest hit ever well, we'll see if, if, if when that happens. I mean, dude, before the movie even came out, people were saying it's uh, the biggest hit ever. It's certified fresh. I think it's at like 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Hey, throw in the jaw box. How fresh is Dunkirk? <laughs> and Matt's not big on Dunkirk. He can trash that movie. Dunkirk sucks. Boring. Yeah. So Not Matt, Thor, that's do you for think, sure. Uh, so they went campy with this one or fun and funny and light, but they're about to go hardcore the other way with the Infinity War. you think they'll be able to dial it back in? You mean, do I think it'll be more serious and, and yeah, 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 I do. Do you think they'll still be able to pull it off though <sighs> after going this fun and jokey? I think if you look at the tone of the first Avengers films, the first two of them, there's always that, that undercurrent of, of comedy. So as long as they don't let it overtake and become like a full blown comedy like this was, then yeah, I think it'll be okay. Hmm. okay. They need to balance it. All right, fellas. Well, how about your favorite scenes? Can I go first, Matt? Please. Because there was a favorite scene of mine in Thor, and it is the uh, opening sort of action sequence that also has this humor that I mentioned. Uh, Thor is chained up. He is uh, dangling down in chains, and he's got this fire demon. He's got a name, but I'll just call him a fire demon in front of him. And uh, because the way he is uh, trapped in these chains, he's sort of spinning um, as he's dangling, and he's talking to him. But eventually, Thor just keeps turning around in this chain right, and, so his back and he's is like well, hold on one second and he's got to <laughs> pause for a while when his back is to him okay right there i thought that i got it i got the joke this is going to be fun yet right after that you got this huge action sequence of thor fighting this this fire demon and it's pretty damn awesome so it's this comedy meets action and at that point i was i was fully on i, I still did enjoy this movie i don't want to give the jawheads the wrong impression matt your favorite thing um, it's the it's the continuation of the scene that we saw in the trailer when when Thor gets thrust into this gladiatorial thing on um, what's really Planet Hulk if you read the comic books, and he fights the Hulk in the arena. I loved it. It was like it just awesome. So much fun. Great action set piece. 
All right. How about your least favorite scene? Um, okay, I mentioned the, the, the film has a couple problems, and part of it is with the exposition here. When they're trying to explain something that, that needs to be said to the audience, I, I feel Marvel thinks they're going to get uh, off here by doing something so simple where I, I mentioned Thor in the very beginning. He's talking to a skeleton, but the camera is is at, at the, uh, the skeleton's point of view. So it looks like Thor's addressing the audience, and then you pull back and see that he's talking to the skeleton. And then in that moment, he's explaining how he got here so that we as an audience are caught up to speed. And then later, one of the worst parts is when Kate Blanchett is doing it, Literally, I thought, oh, my God, they're breaking the fourth wall right in the middle of the movie. She's, like, addressing the audience, and the camera then pulls back, and she almost sort of winks in a way, like, hey, we know we're, we're pulling this off. And you see that she's talking to a whole army on Osgard or Asgard, whatever it's called. At that point, I just thought, weak. Show, don't tell. Too much telling. It was just easy for Marvel. Hmm. Hmm. How about movie influences? Wait, wait, what was oh. Matt's worst scene? I didn't have one. No. Of course not. <laughs> no, but I want to point out another thing that, that you got <laughs> wrong here. There's this character called Scourge, and he's the heart of the movie. It's about his journey to, uh, well, I won't say to where, but he is sort of a, a character of opportunity, and uh, his his journey, I think, is, the, is very serious. And you're also wrong about Kate Blanchett, although I do agree she probably didn't have enough to do. She was awesome. Nah, Loved her. No, nah, <laughs> no. Loved her. Loved no. her. Total waste. No. Total waste to have the talent of Kate Blanchett in this movie. Total waste. Any movie influences besides Guardians? Well, I'm going to tick off a lot of uh, listeners. I know what this one, but uh, Matt, I, I thought the, the biggest influence was Batman Forever. Are you um, serious? Yeah, oh, oh, oh. I really did. It, wow. Batman Forever had the colors, you know, it was like a, this what like hell is popsicle of a movie, and uh, it was sort of campy like Thor was. Now we look back at it and think it's it's terrible, but I think at the time, it probably opened number one, and everybody loved the movie. Nobody liked that movie, when dude. It, I remember when I saw it in the theater, I thought I had a, a fun time with wait, it. Wait, 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 yeah. I don't know, Batman Forever, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> the one with the Riddler? Yeah. That Mr. one's not Freeze. the worst. Mr. Freeze. No, that one's no, a piece that of crap. That's terrible. terrible. That's Batman horrible. Forever, I was think. Was Danny DeVito Mr. Freeze? No, oh, no. 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 Was Schwarzenegger was Mr. Yeah. Freeze, yeah. 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 Influences oh, for you, Matt? Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, it's it's really obvious. It's, it's hard to pick out another influence. I guess if with, with the director, you could kind of point to what we do in Shadows and stuff or some of the sensibility with the jokes. So... What did you learn from this film? Uh, I learned that the, uh, what I, I, I put in air quotes here, the Loki routine of helping and acting like he's a good guy only to turn bad still works with these Marvel fans four or five times now. <laughs> it's the exact thing. And they actually make fun of that in the movie. Okay, but at this point, it's not funny even if you're telling me that we're in on the joke. All right, well, how stupid? Can you do something more creative with it? That was like four times. Oh, dude, come on. You're wrong on that one, no. too. You, you know what it is? You're giving Marvel, like, a pass on all these. That's weak storytelling. It was funny. They they subverted it. Oh, okay. I see, because they <laughs> winked at us. It's, okay, they're, oh, I get it now. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes wow. a good wink is good. Uh, I learned that Thor and Hulk are perfect together. This is like peanut butter and jelly. I hope they do another Thor-Hulk standalone movie just the two of them wow i will say i've i, I don't see all the marvel films like uh matthew here but i uh I, I missed somehow just absolutely missed the second avengers film so i had no clue how hulk got on this it's planet confusing as hell to figure these movies out isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they just come at you like too fast right yeah so literally There's i was 20 of them now i i was confused on how hulk was on this planet i do have to admit i i had to ask somebody afterwards i'm like did i miss something on why hulk would have been there and then they explain that happened in the end of Avengers 2, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. I think there's 20 Marvel films since 2008. Oof. And just to put that into perspective, I believe there's, what, 25 Bond films? And they've been around since wow. the 1960s, maybe the 50s. I as, mean, as Neil was saying, it's a business. Yeah. Yeah. These yeah. guys, Marvel's got it going. Yeah. It's almost like Pixar in terms of their batting average. They just, everything's a winner. And I don't almost. love the movies myself. Some of them I like. I don't see them all. Yeah, but you got to commend them on uh, on what they're up to and what they're doing. It's good. It's good for the industry. If you Marvel know, had the point. Ring franchise, we'd be on yeah. uh, <laughs> Ring ninety one. Man, oh man! All right. So, if you could write a quote for the movie poster, what would it be? Just another Marvel movie. Meh. Yikes! Jesus, man! Ragna rock and roll with the punchlines. 
Eh, not bad. Let's assign some jaws here, Matt. I'm giving this one. Like I said, overall, I did I did have a lot of laughs. Um, two and a half jaws. Three and a half. There you go. Two and a half. I didn't trash the movie. I just I'm, I'm really getting concerned with it. If not for Guardians of the Galaxy, I think this would have been a four-jaw movie, but it's obviously not quite as inspired as the original Guardians. Neil, being a, a producer, where do you feel on the superhero movies? Are we just... Will we ever hit a point of, of fatigue with these? Or? Uh, you, you always do, but I think it, it, this stuff just keeps morphing into other things, which is the natural trajectory. Um, I, th- I mean, if I was Warner Brothers, I'd be really worried about kind of what they have going on because it feels like they're they're playing catch up and the thing's feeling stale. So it's tricky, you know, it's tricky, but I think it's important. You know, it's, it's, a, it's the lifeblood of the industry right now, and that's a good thing. So there's always going to be fatigue, but there's always new customers and kids coming up who see these things for the first time and love it. I mean, Spider-Man just keeps getting retreaded and retreaded, and the new one did well, and you could see they were trying to rip off the tone of some of the other Marvel movies. So it's, sure. it's, it's, I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah. I, I do get frustrated because I, I see so many movies and like leading right up to Thor, I'm seeing like smaller movies that I'm really trying to champion. And it's, it's frustrating to know that that movie, that whatever it may be, uh, the Florida Project or The Killing of a Sacred Deer, sure. the, the Darkest Hour, which uh, we'll talk about later. It, 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 a movie like that is going to struggle to get to 10, 15 million dollars. And, and I want people to see it. And, and I don't hate that something like Thor is going to make $200 million in its first weekend. But that discrepancy between, you know, high quality art that nobody has seen yeah. and just stuff that they know exactly how to make it at this point and hit the bullet points and all oh, these people are going to be happy. It just, so I, guess you're it, saying, I just get disappointed. But you're saying that it's not I, high quality art. Of course it is. Of course it is. Well, fine. I'm not arguing that right now. My my point that I'm trying to make so that you don't steer me wrong here is that I'm just disappointed that so many people are going to go see something like Thor, Thor or whatever Rangoon. it would be. Yeah. And they're not going to see something that, you know, is <laughs> awesome that might might change their mind a little bit, might affect them some way. I, I just want the discrepancy to be no. less. If it was, if it know? was a big hit, you wouldn't like it as much because you're a movie hipster. No, and it's not. Un, I not liked true it before it was cool. Not true at all. Uh, yeah. I, I actually love when there's like a, actually even Dunkirk. For me, I was a fan of Dunkirk. I love that something like Dunkirk can make a hundred million yeah. because that's in that realm of it's still yes there was it was an action movie but yeah. in a way it's a little art house in it in, it in is, a sense it too is. then i'm 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 excited for that i want people to see movies that's it yeah so yeah and the yeah. smaller stuff uh the lower budget stuff that isn't a marvel movie is going to suffer these days because people have so many more options right so whereas you you'd have this menu of things you'd see big and small now it's big small in the theaters and streaming so it's like the smaller stuff will suffer inevitably, which is yeah. sad because there's yeah. less marketing money going to it. Right. But that's why you have shows like Cinema Jaw. At least one host on Cinema Jaw is pushing for the little guy, you know? I love it. Yeah. Well, I think Marvel's pushing for him too. Look at look at the director, Waititi. Hey, I'm glad. And we can give a, a shout out to his, his movie, What We Do in the Shadows. If you love that movie. If you're looking to follow up and see something absolutely hilarious and a little different check out what we do in the shadows Please. at least we can recommend that yes we can and agree on that all right we are on to mysteries uh this is our top five list uh neil you're our guest we always like to ask the guest uh, did you have fun coming up with the list was it a difficult list to come up I with i did have fun it wasn't difficult uh it was um always challenging to number them and it's always sad to leave some movies off yeah, yeah. and my numbers always change the movies i love like Etc. So, <laughs> all right, murder mysteries. What do you got sitting at number five, Neil? Number five is Clute. I thought he said Clue, but he said Clute. I did say Clute. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to make sure. <laughs> never heard of it. Oh, you've never heard of no. Clute? No, no. I have not either, Neil. Clute is a movie starring Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland. Jane Fonda sold. Jane Fonda is a call girl in New York City, and one of her Johns, who's a businessman, ends up murdered. Clute is called in, that is Donald Sutherland, and mystery and intrigue ensues, and it's kind of a horror film. It's creepy, it's disturbing, there's some beautiful sequences. It's directed by Alan J. Pakula, um, and it's shot on uh, Panavision anamorphic, I think, E and C series lenses, which I love, uh-huh. and it's a beautiful movie. I highly recommend it. It sure. holds up. 
C. Clute. It's awesome. I yeah. love it. Uh, see if it's streaming anywhere. Uh, can you throw that in the job box? Yeah, look at it. I, and I was just thinking, I don't think any other actor can play a, a character named Clute other than Donald Sutherland. <laughs> That is true. Nice nice uh, pick there. Getting us started strong, Matt. Can you follow it up? Maybe. I don't know. I, I love this movie. It is an absolute masterpiece. Uh, came out in 2003 from uh, Park Chan-wook, old boy. Oh, awesome movie. Yeah, it's an awesome movie. Uh, th- some of the best action sequences, the hammer fight scene especially, is just something I could watch over and over again. But the mystery element keeps you guessing to the very end and i mean the last seconds of the movie and what an ending i mean when you finally understand everything it's just a mind you know oh yeah it gets you it gets you big time and it still gets me when i think about it it's a great one yeah speaking of remakes spike lee remade that i have never seen the remake uh have, has anybody in the no. room no no didn't see it it's it's kind of blasphemous yeah. to see a remake of that movie fish tank I phil agree. back there was given thumbs down so we can just go by phil thumbs down <laughs> um matt that swings it over to my number five uh ethan hawk 2012 not sure I've had this ever on a top five list, but I enjoyed it. And it's actually a decent film to watch right around Halloween. I'm speaking of Sinister. Not sure if you guys are familiar. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love Sinister. Oh, you do? Great film. Yeah. So this is where Ethan Hawke plays a true crime uh, writer. And he moves his family into a house where a family was murdered. And they weren't just murdered. They were hung on a tree branch right outside the house and he does not tell his wife that they're moving into these this victim's house and he's going there for inspiration to write his next crime novel thinking that the cops had made mistakes and whatnot and what he ends up finding then at that point is these super eight uh tapes that actually have other murders and you can never figure out who is doing the murder and so involves the the mystery of it all but it's a scare along the way too it's got some good jump scares in that movie i mean i would consider it more of a horror film but it is a mystery and it's directed by scott derrickson who directed dr strange see see yeah, that sinister is an awesome <clears throat> film yes that's a good call that is my number five thank you i feel i feel good that i got neil on my side here never saw sinister too I, I haven't, but I think we must. We yes. owe it to ourselves. <laughs> I agree. All right, that was our fives. We're into our four. Neil, what do you got sitting there? Four for me is out of the past. Another one I've not I heard of. I love it. We got to have Neil on every week. <laughs> Tell me about this out one. Out of the past is probably the best noir film ever made, starring Robert Mitchum. Black Wait, and white ooh. film. Um, Robert Mitchum is leading a very humble, quiet life as a gas station attendant when a thug comes to him to drag him back into his shady past. Noir heaven, beautifully shot, complex plot, unbelievable things going on. I'm not sure the movie completely adds up. It may be a touch confusing, but it is awesome. It, I think it is the pinnacle of, of noir films. Wow. When you say... You and a murder it, mystery, obviously, sure. as well. Oh, yeah. Did you say it was the, the, the greatest noir film ever made or the greatest noir film with Robert Mitchum? I think it is the greatest noir film ever made. Okay. It's, it competes with a few others, and there's one other on my list. And, and it's odd that the other one is above it, but it's, it's neck and neck. Yeah. Out of the Past, directed by Jacques Tourneau, who directed some of the... Doctor class- Strange too. No, <laughs> close, but who directed... Um, uh, Val Luton horror films at RKO, which are these low-budget horror films. Um, and uh, he had an eclectic career, but this film is just something special. Hmm. Wow. Now I really want to see it. That uh, is a great too. sell, man. Me too. Yeah. This is awesome. We, we haven't had one of these where I get really excited about watching these movies. This yeah. is awesome. Uh, I, lo- I love noir. What do you got it for? I, I think this, this movie has a, a definite touch of noir. Um, Mark Ruffalo's in it, The Hulk. And it is directed by Martin Scorsese, 2010's Shutter Island. I like this one. I hate that movie. Really? What? You I don't like, like Shutter one. Island? I think it's an abomination. Holy wow. crap, really? I mean, really? it's got a gut punch of a reveal, though. Really? Yeah, you didn't it's like that? It's a snooze fest. 
<laughs> oh man, when Leonardo he's... DiCaprio walking through, I I just thought it was just here trying so oh, hard. I love the the, the oh. mood that it set. It's so that creepy. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Here's what I think, Neil. Too is I I think. We go into this movie, we pretty much know the twist in, in some degree, right? It, it might, yeah. It's a variation on the twist, but we all know more or less it's between these two lines of a twist. And it does fall there, but it's... I don't think I it, saw it coming. Oh, but, I did. Oh, I did. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the meaning of the twist and what exactly happened to get him on that island and in the hospital. Oh, well, like, in that what sense, he yes. Did in that, and that was like, oh, this is sort of devastating. That's why I always came around on the film. I, I, I enjoyed it. I'll give it a second viewing, but I really disliked it. I, hmm. I thought it was just, once I know what's going on, I'm out. And a movie like that. Mm -hmm. Jackie Earl Haley? I... No? Didn't do it, huh? I, I just like the tone, really the creepiness, just... the isolation. Yes, of course, I, I think everybody knew that, that he was sort of walking into his own prison, so to speak, without giving anything away. But the specifics, like Ryan was saying, of, of what he did to get to that prison was a big... I don't, I don't, I don't it's crushing. Think, with all due respect to Mr. Scorsese, I think when he kind of hedges into that zone, which is a little bit of the horror, darker stuff, it's not as strong suit, in mm -hmm. my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. Bringing Out the Dead... Another not great movie that he directed that's somewhat Same. in that zone. Yeah. And I remember this one actually got like a, a February release. I remember it was like sort of almost thrown away. Like it was going to be. Because they were confused about how to market the exactly. movie. Is it a horror film? I Is remember. it a thriller? Yeah. yeah. Because if it's, if it's got Scorsese and it's got DiCaprio, they're putting this out in like October, November, hoping that it's going to get some Oscar buzz. And they ended up holding it, I remember, because they're like, eh, it's not an Oscar movie. Right. And then I thought, oh, it's not going to be worth even seeing. Um, but I came around on it. I'm, I'm on Matt's side more than Neil's side here, and I, I did enjoy it. So, okay. all right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, swings it over to my number four. And maybe I can give a Q-tip here, but maybe not. Maybe Neil's seen this one. This one, uh, foreign film, 2009 Spanish film. They made an English remake. I am speaking of... The Secret in Their Eyes. I have seen this film. <laughs> yes. But I don't remember it. Okay, so they, they remade it with uh, Julia Roberts and uh, I want to say Chiwetel Ejiofor, possibly. I forget who it was all in the, in the American remake. But in, in 2009 Spanish film, The Secret in Their Eyes, it's basically two storylines are going on 25 years apart. And we, we pick it up... Uh, 25 years later with this guy saying he's writing a book on a case that they just couldn't quite solve. And they sort of flash back to those 25 years and a guy's wife has been murdered and they're trying to figure out who murdered the, uh, the woman. And this guy's like a, a new detective and these uh, two people are trying to solve it and they think they have their guy, but they can't quite make the case on who they believe it is and needless to say he goes free and they then tell the uh husband of who's the widow you know at this point the widower they say hey we're gonna get him at some point and he'll never go free and they, they flash back and forth and then we go back to that 25 year uh later so present day and there's a big twist where they go see the guy and he actually says hey i, I caught him I caught the murderer and I killed him, but that's not where it ends. There's another twist to it. I have not seen this no? movie, but now I'm going to. Oh, it's so good. There, there's this two great, twists, two yeah. twists at the end, and I it's love it. and it's one of those definitely like once you see it, you're like, oh my god, this is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, if they're gonna make a, a you know a remake a few years later, English version, you know there was something there. Being a producer, obviously, with the ring, you see something, yeah. and you're like. Oh, we got gold here, and, right? And, and more times than not, the foreign films are better than what we try to replicate mm -hmm. in America. That is often well. the case. Yeah. yeah. So The Secret in Their Eyes, 2009 yeah. film, Seek It Good Out. One. So that was my number four. We're into our threes, Neil. Number three is a movie that may be my favorite film of all time. Wow. Which is Le Samurai. At least directed, I know this one. Directed by jean Paris Melville, starring Alain Delon. Um... Alain Delon is a hitman who commits a crime at the top of the film. And the investigation begins to solve who committed this crime. And you see him going through the machinations, Delon, of committing his crime and setting up his alibi. And then in comes a detective who tries to unravel what Delon has done. And so it's, it's oddly a mystery, even though you know he committed the crime, 
but it becomes this game of cat and mouse and then what is Delone going to ultimately do? It's just kind of cinema perfection because Jean-Pierre Melville was um, the ultimate stylist and an absolute genius. And the movie is just sublime and, and is my favorite film of all time. What's um, it called now? Le Samurai. Le Samurai. Um, it's Mana from Heaven. Yeah. Wow. I love it. I yeah. just love the, the, the passion that Neil has towards the movies. It's another one I haven't got seen, going. man. I got to see yeah, this. Yes. Yeah, this is, I'm this just going to... Burn through your entire list. Yeah, this is God. List. my my list. I, I I hate following up Neil. This one's <laughs> no, you're, you're you're going strong. This, Old boy is a good one. This one is pedestrian. But look, listen, you have to put it on the mystery list. You just have to put Clue on the list. <laughs> I had it as an honorable mention of mine. It has to be done. Okay, fine. It's obvious, and I don't think I need to say much more than Tim Curry, uh, maybe Christopher Lloyd, and Madeline Kahn. I, the whole cast is amazing. It's it's Clue. It's a movie based on a board game, but it's so much more than that. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Nice pick. Uh, swings us over to my number three, and I, I was putting this on the list, and I, I actually got a little upset uh, bringing us back to the, the Harvey Weinstein uh, scandal, and we, we read that nice email last week from uh, Joe talking about taking, as a viewer, taking Harvey's name off the movie in a way and still being able to enjoy the great art that, that he made. And I, I bring that up because I think well, this was- the Others Made. Yeah, that Others Made. Because this was one of the first Weinstein films, that I, I, Miramax at the time, uh, that I remember jumping out that was like, what what is the studio behind this movie? 1992, Forrest Whitaker in The Crying Game. Sell me this as a mystery, though. All right. Well, the, A, the mystery is, I mean, in, in, to some degree, is that, that she is a he in, in some. There's a reveal there. I don't know the, if it was ever a mystery, though. Well, then what ends up happening, though, is, okay, so then he ends up taking more or less the blame for the killing at the end. And there's, there's this whole mystery of, like, why, I don't know, like, why he would go through with it. Did he really fall in love with this? woman who he now knows is a man um is it a mystery in in the sense that they, you're trying to solve exactly who did it no but is it a the whole movie feel like a mystery yes i i think because of I the that's the, fair the yeah. reveal of the yeah. character is is hidden i guess uh, it has that element to it and then it's, this whole idea of is he really falling in love with her or is he not there's this like mystery of what is going on until the end when you realize his true intentions. I think at the very end is finally when you're like, oh, he really was in love with her, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I, that whole, the movie felt like a mystery while I was that watching it. That movie is like the height of independent cinema too. Yeah. Like the height of independent cinema. Yeah. I mean, well, it could be almost, a, you could say it, it was a springboard for a lot that, yeah. that followed, Yeah. you know? Yeah. It opened some Good doors. One. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. That was my number three, yeah. The Crying Game. Good. Neil, number two, buddy. Number two is uh, a movie I absolutely love. Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation. Oh. Gene Hackman at his best, huh? Gene Hackman at his best. Yeah. And I think a near-perfect movie. Gene Hackman. I, agree. I, 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 I think the, um, to that moment, the pinnacle of sound design. Oh, yeah. Um, Gene Hackman plays uh, a character who... Uh, is kind of an audiophile and an expert uh, uh, at, at, at recording sounds. <laughs> and this is the 70s, mind you. So this this is the, the, 70s. the recording is, yeah. is the real, the real, yeah. you know. Yeah, and he uh, is hired by some shadowy operation to record a conversation in uh, San Francisco at uh, Union Square, which opens the film. And uh, I call it a character thriller. It mm -hmm. is just perfect filmmaking. There's a murder... There's Harrison Ford. There's uh, a, a host of great actors. Um, it's just a perfect film. It's beautifully shot, and and Hackman is unbelievable in it. His, yeah. his performance is amazing. So it works as a thriller and a mystery, and it works like off the charts as a character study about a lonely person who's kind of listening into people's lives. And he himself has this hollow life, and he's looking for answers in his own life. It's it's an amazing, perfect film. Yeah, in many ways. And and that opening sequence that you say that takes place in in San Francisco, what a what a scene that is. Unbelievable. I mean, scene. That's one of those. I remember when I watched it, I was like, oh, oh, th this is a master at work. You know, like sometimes the light bulb goes off in your head. 
it was one of those moments. I watched it, it and I'm like, oh, well, this is, it is, this is true work. cinema. And yeah. Walter Murch, who edited the film, also is responsible for, I think, coined the term sound design, sound designer with that film, because he did both. He was the editor and I think the sound designer, if my memory's awesome. accurate, and it's a perfect film. Yeah. The conversation. Love that movie. Great pick. Uh, Matt, yeah, you're right. You got a tough job following up Neil. So, <laughs> yeah. so glad I got the buffer and I'm following Matt up. <laughs> now this is like a blood sport, I feel like. Uh, yeah. my, my number one better be really good because now I kind of want to humiliate you guys. You, me, you put me in this position where I have to dominate. I, I feel like my number one, at least, is going to be tough to argue with. But uh, I know where you're going with it, I bet. <laughs> maybe. Uh, this one, very, very, very recent. Uh, just came out a few weeks ago. Blade Runner 2049. Oh, come on. Really? Jesus. You, no? Well, I mean, all right. I mean, for a mystery film. Plus, we just talked about it. So. All right, yeah. So I'm not going to belabor it. But listen, guys, I, I, I cannot overstate. I think this is not only my favorite movie of the year, but probably my favorite movie of the last 10 years. Oh, yeah. I, I loved it. Loved it. It is like Citizen Kane worthy. Like the, the photography in this movie nobody's come close dunkirk be damned this year it, it stands head and shoulders above talk about sound design i've never heard anything like this movie i've been spinning the soundtrack since i got out of the theater just went to youtube and i play it non-stop while i'm working love it love it love it and it's a great mystery i guess more of a character study like uh you know what it means to be human and stuff but there are some uh sufficient twists and turns and mystery to keep me intrigued to the end sure all right i, I need to see it yeah it's I love really it good already and i know i'll love it so yeah good um a, a mutual friend between me and matt uh jim terry who's a comic book artist you, you can only imagine how much he loves this movie and i saw him on social media at one point i saw he said going to see blade runner for a third time it, it feels like a lot of people the people who are going to love this movie aren't going to want to let it go to see it in the, in the theater or something special. And I think people realize that. So they're going to it. So we saw a third time I saw him. And then just the other day he said, I'm like Instagram. He's he, he put a picture up there and he's like, look at the colors in the street. Reminds me of blade runner 2049. He's like, eh, I got two and a half hours to kill. <laughs> so he's probably going for a fourth time. That's yeah. awesome. So it's, it's worth it. Yeah. All right. Swings it over to my number two, second foreign film listed. And this is, this is a doozy. This one came out in 2010. The director here is uh, probably the, one of the best working today, uh, following up Matt's pick of uh, Blade Runner 2049. I'm speaking of the director, Denis Villeneuve. Did I say it pretty close, I think? I'm getting better with yep. it. D Denis? Denis. Yeah. Denis Villeneuve. Um, his very first feature film, 2010, Incendies. I have not seen that movie, but I did. I watched Passengers recently, and I... I saw it as an option, so I will watch it now. Yes. Incendies, uh, this was how I came to know uh, Denny's work, tells the story of a brother and sister who are, are twins, live in Canada, and their mother passes away, and she cannot get a proper burial uh, until a, a promise is kept. And the promise, uh, she came from a Middle Eastern country, unnamed Middle Eastern country, and these brother and sister go back into the sort of it's in the present, but like digging through the past of their mom's past, figuring out all the things that had went on. There's like the civil war that goes on in, in the country that had taken place and the bad things that have happened there. And so they're trying to sort of track down this promise that was made. And along the ways, and I don't want to spoil it because nobody here in this room has seen the film. There is a twist. Uh, you mentioned Old Boy. This is the only other film that I would say is like a holy cow kind of ending it's awesome incendies sold um, yes it's it's the best so and i meant to say prisoners not prisoners passengers. yeah 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 that, that passengers yeah, yeah is with yeah Chris Jennifer Pratt Lawrence. And Jennifer, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. thinking Prisoners, yes. yeah, which is great. Yes. Another Denny film. Yes. All right, uh, that was my number two in Sundays. Big fan. Here we are. This is Cinema Jaw, and this is our number one mystery movies. Neil. My number one mystery movie is The Big Sleep, starring Humphrey Bogart, directed by Howard Hawks. This is a movie you can watch endlessly. How, uh, Howard Hawks was. A genius, one of my favorite filmmakers. This was this is pinnacle noir, right up there with Out of the Past. Um, Bogart uh, is uh, 
playing Philip Marlowe, and uh, he he's he's brought to this uh, uh, mansion where he there's an old man in in the back of the house in the uh, uh, in the garden. My, my my mind's slipping a little bit because I'm trying to get ahead of myself, and he wants. Bogart to investigate his two young daughters' gambling habits. This guy's in a wheelchair. He's like 80. And Bogey uh, has to start investigating his daughters, who are um, very young and very beautiful. And and uh, it's mysterious and weird and sexual and intriguing and beautifully shot and funny. And it's just like one of these old movies that you cannot stop watching over and over and over again. The mystery does not add up. It has never added up. It makes no <laughs> sense. There's multiple endings that were shot. You can see different versions. It's just kind of a uh, uh, cinema gold, and uh, you can't not love it. It's got everything going for it. And one of the daughters, I might add, is Lauren Bacall. Ooh, wow. So Bogey, Bacall. Yeah, uh, some cast. legends. It's an awesome film. Hmm. Um, highly recommend it, and I think it's probably the greatest Mystery of all time. Wow. See, I, there's something, uh, there's a pattern I'm noticing. Yeah. It doesn't matter so much for you if the mystery is solved. It's more about the mystery itself, huh? Yeah. Um, I think he likes it if it isn't solved. Yeah, more yeah. So. yeah, <laughs> yeah, which goes back to the Mulholland Drive. Right. But I think that, that uh, when it works perfectly, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But when it's also open to interpretation and it's about getting into these worlds and the tone and the texture mm. and trying to look back and solve things, it's like this... Unsolved. I, I am just so intrigued by that because I keep watching it and then it becomes, I fall in love with it and I want to watch it again. Like I could go right now home and watch The Big Sleep and it would be like the greatest thing ever. You know, it's just beautiful stuff. Much better than The Big Chill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Spe speaking of <laughs> gold bloom, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, here we are, Matt. Following, right. up, following up Neil. What do you got? Listen, I don't, I don't know if this is a proper follow-up, um, especially with the, the noir that you've mentioned, but this is certainly So high. happy that Matt already mentioned Clue. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it could, Clue could be a topper for mysteries, but it's not. I'm going with 74 Roman Polanski, Chinatown. Oh, that's, that's solid. It's solid, right? I love the film. That's one of the greatest movies yeah, ever I, made. I mean, that's, a good, that's a good call. I, I've mentioned Mulholland Drive is my favorite. For sure, Chinatown's in my top 10. I always say it's a top 10 film for me. For it's sure. a top 10 film for me as well. Absolutely. But it's also a really great mystery that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and then in the end, with the, like, she's my mother, my sister, <laughs> my mother. Like, I could just watch that scene over and over again. It's, it's great beginning to end. It doesn't really matter what the mystery is. It, it, it's more about... LA and the tone and that's Chinatown, you know, yeah. it's great. I, I love noirs like that where, where it is starts off such a small story and it, it ends in this epic story of the yeah. water and the valley and the, you know, it's just massive. So great pick. Uh, I have to follow it up with a classic as well. I mean, no Hitchcock listed. I was thinking the right. same thing. Nobody's I, got Hitchcock. I, I'm yeah. sitting here and, and I, I love and Hitchcock. I have, and I have the power to to say yay or nay to no Hitchcock. I'm going Hitchcock. Damn it. 1958, also a top ten film of mine. I'm going Vertigo. Uh, well done. I was afraid you were going to go north by northwest. Which no, you go there a lot. Window. Or rear window. I mean, so you could go. You one. could go multiple ways with Hitchcock, right? But for me, when I looked at this list. Uh, you know what it was too is I saw Vertigo when I was I was a young kid. I can still remember where I saw it and who I was with. And I I mean, I'm talking like early teen, maybe I was 13, and I really didn't quite understand the movie. And I think that leads to Neil's point where I'm watching a movie. There's a mystery going on. I understand that there's a mystery, but I'm not fully sure at that age that I I, I understood the movie. You got you know um, Kim Novak playing basically two people and i remember thinking is she supposed to be the same person isn't she supposed to be the same person and then to come to find out that that's somewhat what hitchcock his whole intention was to sort of fool the viewer i mean yes we more or less know it's the same actress but the way the film doesn't give in to the fact that this is the a person playing a dual role you almost start to second guess yourself at least i do every single time i watch it it's it has that that feeling and i mean all the way up to i mean jimmy stewart running up the, the bell tower how classic does it get you know and then the whole reveal is it, it's pretty fantastic I, it's a near perfect movie yeah. and it's beautiful to look at stunning if you've seen the restoration i, I yeah i got a beautiful uh, dvd version of it unbelievable yeah. film that's a that's a really good call 
Yeah, and Stewart and Hitchcock, those two, like he wanted to take that darker turn after all the schmaltzy stuff he had mm-hmm. done, and I thought uh, those that's some of his best work. There's some very dark stuff in that movie. There's innuendo about him raping her when he first brings her home. If right. You, if you follow that scene, there's some very sinister, dark stuff in that film. Yeah. yeah. Um, but great call. Yeah. Beautiful. We came with it some is. heavy hitters on number one. We did. Yeah. All right. Any honorable mentions uh, before we go to break? Uh, I mean, I, the usual suspects you got to throw yeah, somewhere sure. in there. Yeah, sure. Pretty good. Pretty good. Although Brian Singer's disturbing on so many levels, yeah. you know, uh, but it's a great <laughs> film. Um, there's a whole list of older stuff I absolutely love. Uh, Lake Caribou It's a French film about a poison letter that starts spreading through a small town people start killing themselves it's yeah. a beautiful film there's a lot of great oh, it's kind of like yeah. a prototype of the ring almost yeah, it with is. The, yeah it it's is. interesting it's been ripped off endlessly and it was made during the nazi occupation and believed that the film was financed by the nazis it's an Ooh. interesting film but it's Whoa. a mystery yeah. it's awesome there's a lot of good you start getting into foreign mystery stuff it's it's hmm. it's it's endless yeah it's endless stuff yeah the only classic one i had on my list was uh the night of the hunter Great film. I love that movie. Yep. Um, Mitchum. Yep. That's where I thought you Ch- were going with Charles Mitchum. Charles Lott yeah. directed it. Yeah. Um, Gone Baby Gone for uh, an Affleck-directed movie with Casey Affleck where, you know, yeah. the child is stolen and no one can figure out who it is. Even though I think 30, 40 minutes in, I knew who it was. And Gone Girl, uh, actually, mm. r- m- sort of a recent kind of dark, twisty type of movie. I don't know if that was really a mystery. Uh, all right, I got it's a couple. It's an honorable. It was. I think it was. Yeah. I, I got a couple. All right. Memento. Got to be said. All right. Yeah. It's, it's very good noir. Gets brought up a lot. The Prestige kept me guessing all the way to the end. And what? That's another gut punch. Uh, Vertigo, you mentioned. Um, Minority Report. I think that's got some legs to it. All right. All right. Should have left yeah. it off yeah. at uh, yeah. Prestige. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Jawheads, if we missed your favorite movie mystery, Shoot us a tweet at Cinema Jaw. We'll retweet it, get the discussion going, or write us feedback at cinemajaw.com. We'd love getting that feedback. What we're going to do is take a quick break, get some refreshments when we come back. Matt is taking Neil on in Orient Express cast movie trivia, plus a cinema war looking at Francis McDormand. We'll be right back on Cinema Jaw. Let's all go to the live. Hey Jawheads, this is Matt Kay. There's a lot of ways you can support Cinema Jaw, and one of the best ones is Patreon. Patreon? Is that like a Marvel superhero? No, it's not a Marvel superhero. It's kind of like Kickstarter, though, but for projects that are ongoing, not just like one and done. Like Cinema Jaw. Exactly, just like Cinema Jaw. So check it out. It's at patreon.com backslash Cinema Jaw. We have different levels of support to, to fit your budget. You can give as little or as much as you like. And hopefully you'll join one of our top tiers like Darren Mordecai did. And uh, you get our undying thanks, along with some cool swag like t-shirts, flasks, stickers, all kinds of good stuff. Heck yeah, exclusive t-shirt I put together. It looks pretty cool. That's right. Yeah, you did. And you did a great job on it. Thank you, buddy. We're about to make a new design for it, too. So go over to patreon.com backslash cinema jaw and check out all our cool rewards. And thanks, Darren Mordecai. Thanks, buddy. To get ourselves a treat. And we are back hanging out here with Neil Edelstein. Uh, Neil, I did want to ask you. You mentioned uh, that you would ask David Lynch, you know, where are these teeth? Did, you, did somebody keep the teeth? When, when you're making a movie like The Ring or Mulholland Drive, was there something from the movie, a, a, a memento of the film that you yourself kept? No. No. Nothing? No. I think you get so uh, desensitized by all of it. By the end, you're just like... Get this crap away from me. I need to go to Mexico, Atlanta Beach. I don't know where this stuff's going, but it goes into storage somewhere. I remember going to New Line Storage once because I had to put some stuff away, and man, oh man, that was a treasure trove. Wow. Really? Oh, was it like wow. a warehouse in it's Indiana where, Jones? It, it was. It's, um, it, movie props? It, props and everything's kind of sectioned off yeah and it's massive (laughs) and you walk through there and you're trying not to look at other stuff because you got to put or grab we're doing a reshoot and you had to grab your crappy stuff but there's like freddy krueger stuff and it's it's pretty intense i would love that yeah they don't show you that on the tours no 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 (laughs) man um what was the other question i had for you was um 
hold on, let me think of it. That, that awesome uh, detail threw me off here. Uh, I was going to ask, you had mentioned, and this is not to name drop here, but yeah. we, we are recording a day off of, we were going to record on Wednesday, and Neil says to us, hey, can you make it Thursday? I have a dinner date with uh, <clears throat> Gary Oldman. Is, am, I, am I saying this right? Uh, is this he, how this whole thing goes down? Uh, but, you bumped us for Gary Oldman? Close. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was his movie <laughs> that he screened here, and then, and then, and then it was uh, some hangout time after with him and his, his manager, Douglas Urbanski, who's a friend of mine. So and and uh, Gary's wife. Ah, oh, it's so, awesome. So yeah. So this was for the darkest hour. Correct. Um, me and Matt are going to have a review for the Jawheads, but in a snippet, how great was it? It's an excellent movie. I mean, it 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 is just, uh, it's kind of pure beautiful cinema, and it's a great story and an amazing performance. I think Gary Oldman. Um, I clearly haven't seen all the the movies, but uh, he is just going to be a shoe in to win the Oscar. His Churchill performance is pitch perfect. The makeup is incredible. You don't really notice it, but you're kind of thinking, like, how did they do this? And he is, he, he's sublime. It's an, it's an unbelievable performance. And I'm a Gary Oldman fan um, and love everything he does. So, But the movie's great, too. So awesome. it works on all levels. I think everyone nice. will love it. And if you don't know anything about Churchill, you'll still love it because it's educational in a way that's entertaining. Mm. So it's, it's a fantastic movie. That's it's so cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Neil's gotten me excited for a, a bunch of movies. This, yeah, this jaw. I, yeah, honestly, uh, of the films that were on your list, if if you sent me home to watch just one, which would which one should Le I watch t- tonight? The Samurai. Yeah. Okay, I'm doing it tonight. Yeah. Nice. Perfect movie. Yeah. Love it. All right, Matt, before we get to cinema or before we get to trivia, we did throw a few items actually into the jaw box, and I know Elias wants to get out and say hi to Neil. Let's open up that jaw box. <laughs> What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. We got a box! Oh, what's in the box? How's it going, fellas? You know what? I think I figured out what your PS would be, PSA would be. It would be to talk this generation into watching old noir films because... <laughs> That'd be good. Wow, was I sold. I was, uh, I've been yeah. missing out. Uh, so let's jump into the question. So what was the Disney production company with the Sphinx logo? That was Hollywood Pictures. There you go. Uh, let's see. Cool logo, right? Cool yeah. logo, but kind of a crappy name hollywood <laughs> pictures yeah it's probably some left behind like corporation from like 1920 yeah, shell yeah. company put it <laughs> under hollywood <laughs> films logo pictures. Uh, so who was the murder on orient express the original film which actually came out in 1974 who was that directed by that was sydney wow. lemay sydney lamet lamet yeah, yeah. I, I knew matt was way off when he was talking about the 20s or something well i guess wait no, that's no, when the you, novel you, 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 ten, ten, that was when the novel came out you may be thinking about uh, and then there were none which was 10 Little Indians, which is a film from yeah, like don't give Matt that much credit. 45 or something. I don't know, maybe. No, don't give me that much yeah. credit. <laughs> but Sidney Lumet, that, that, that's a great film, which I have not seen for Oh, you haven't years. seen the original. Oh, you have seen I it. I have, okay. but it's been yeah. like my dad dragged me to that movie at like mm-hmm. the Evanston Theater, the, that big, beautiful theater. I love that theater. It is a great yeah. theater. It's gone, isn't it? It is. Oh, well, I guess I'm on. thinking of the You're century. You're thinking of the new one that they got up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the landmark. Century. Yeah. Still a nice art house theater, at least if you're going to see cinema. Yeah. Not quite in the city, but you're in the suburbs, so at least they give that to you. Just outside. You can get there on the purple line. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, how fresh is Dunkirk on Rotten Tomatoes? It's 92%. <laughs> Thor's 94%. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Thor wins. <laughs> Thor wins. Thor Rangoon. Well, yeah. You guys, come on now. Crowd. Is Clute streaming? Uh, it's not on. Ah. It's not included in the services, but you could rent it uh, on your go-to service for as little as two ninety-nine. Not bad. Oh, good. Not yeah. bad. But I love when they have. It, we do these every once in a while. We throw it in there, and they're like, "Yeah, it's streaming on Amazon Prime or Netflix." It's like that's what yeah. I'm doing tonight. So yeah, but for two ninety-nine, not bad. Yeah, I'll go. jump in. Was that everything? That was all. Get back in that job box. We'll do. Matt, it brings us to a segment called Cinema War. Cinema War, it works like this. Me and Matt, we're fighting on a topic. Neil, our guest, is playing jury and executioner this week, and he tells the Jawheads at home who he thinks won this Cinema War. It's important, Matt, because we're fighting for jaw time to rant and rave on whatever we want. Francis McDormand. Heck, Elias, tell the Jawheads at home what today's Cinema War topic is. Today's Cinema War topic, Francis McDormand. Is she an A-lister? Or, uh, that sells tickets, or just a great actor. Ryan, you'll be fighting a lister. Matt, you'll be fighting a great actor. But I'm just not paying to see her. 
Let's let this cinema war by a couple of C-lister podcasters <laughs> begin. <laughs> Matt, does Francis McDormand get people excited enough to buy a movie ticket? Damn right she does. Her Oscar-winning performance in Fargo should really be the only point I need to make. I go to the movies to get lost in a story. McDormand is one of the best leading ladies at getting lost in a character. She is a treasure. Listen, a box office draw and Frances McDormand, who's better known as the lady from Fargo, the only point you need to make is pretty much the only point you can make. She has one hit, and you might get the occasional oddball who mentions Burn After Reading, but really, other than those two films, it's tough to name anything she's in. <laughs> <laughs> Being married to the Cohen brothers and appearing in seven of their films kind of helps her case. You rarely see Frances in a movie that is a total dud. So having her in the cast is kind of a signal to the audience that they are paying to see a quality film. Frances McDormand is a lovely actress and sort of funny sometimes, you know? But unless she gets a role in the next Star Wars film... With titles like three billboards outside of wherever the hell it's outside of, they're just not going to make her into a huge name. Matt, Frances McDormand has range like few other actresses in Hollywood. She can be funny like an almost famous. Don't take drugs. And she can be serious like in North Country. Her work is... Why do you get audio clues? <laughs> That's so not fair. Hey, I'm running the show here. <laughs> Her work is, re is a reason I love cinema, and I would buy a ticket for that. Okay, a reason you would, right? Yeah. But that's not what we're arguing. We're, we're also not arguing her range. Yeah, Frances McDormand is one hell of a character actor. And even though you love her, Ryan... And I love her. She's not a box office draw. We're not going to see her name above a title card anytime soon. And the simple reason is that because uh, the movies she's in aren't even designed to be big box office hits. They're designed to be played in little sleepy specialty theaters where indie gems play. That's just a fact. Matt says she makes no good movies. Wonder I did not. Boys. Yes, you did. Wonder Boys, Raising Arizona, Mississippi Burning, Moonrise Kingdom. There is a reason I'm listing off great films because they all feature the work of Francis McDormand. In a time with too much CGI, a time when moviegoers may want to see something real, it does not get more real than the talent of Francis. Is she a reason to check out a movie? You betcha. She said, she said Raising Arizona for like three seconds. Counts. I, I, I would put McDormand in the same category as Harry Dean Stanton, who I love. And industry insiders and movie buffs like us love these people, but they're not the reason most of the masses, asses though you like to call them, Rye, that's not why they're going to see the movies, not for these actors. Wow. We are buttonheads here on Cinema Jaw and doing our cinema war as we do each and every week we throw it to our guest our jury neil what did you think of this cinema war unbelievable spirited war i mean we're, we're dating ourselves a little bit here i still can't pronounce francis mcdermott's last name uh, it's mcdermott Mc, mcdormand mcdormand it ends with a d Mc, yeah yeah uh, i still can't pronounce it <laughs> um unbelievable talent uh married to one of the cone brothers so probably doesn't have to work that much um gets to pick and choose her roles I, I think she's a mega talent i can't tell you the last time i saw her in a movie and uh she peaked at fargo i think in terms of being anything up here um you know i i I, I gotta go with Matt on this. Oh, yeah. Yes. I gotta say, you know, uh, she's not doing it for me. Wow. Um, this is great. Yeah, He's like, I, oh, I, I, I don't know I, how I, you're gonna I, win I, this one, yeah, Matt. I, 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 I just, uh, I respect her. She's talented and I love your passion yeah. for it. But she's not wow. a, she's she's not driving box office i'm buying the ticket well, so I, she in some yeah. way is by is driving it That's at least good. for me at and, least for and, me you know and we 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 asked phil who's pretty plugged into pop culture i'm like phil have you heard of francis mcdormand and he said no yeah <laughs> he can't even have, pronounce her last name yeah i can't <laughs> have you heard of brad pitt yeah have you heard of john malkovich yeah he yeah. she was in a movie with both those yeah. guys still hasn't heard of her all right that earns me 20 seconds i only need 10 to rant about whatever i want let's talk about concession prices ridiculous i love theaters and i want them to stay in business but 15 bucks this is no joke 15 bucks 
for a Coke, a medium, and a pack of Twizzlers. Wow. Good night. Did that yeah. Coke have that uh, Cook County tax on it? Or? This was actually yeah. in, in Evanston, as yeah. we were just talking about it. So, no, not the Cook County. I don't, oh, maybe yeah, they I are think Cook, it's Cook County. County. Isn't Evanston Cook County? Yeah, yeah I believe okay, so. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, yes, to the Cook County thing. But it's just ridiculous, guys. Come on. Yeah. $15 for, for a for tiny for the amount of sugar you're supposed to have in a day is They're I mean, getting it's just squeezed, ridiculous. though. you got to have a little sympathy for them. I they're, do. They're, they're getting hit hard. So, they're trying to find the equilibrium, you know, and it's. I think the higher those prices go, that's not a good sign because it means they're trying to make up for something. Yeah, that's true. It's Bring true. Bring your uh, camel. You know those camel backpacks with the bladder? Just fill yeah. that thing up with Coke, get in there, you got your straw, you're good to go. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, and not to, not to belabor this, but <laughs> the beer prices, because almost every theater you go to now serves beer. It used to be a rarity, but now you get a beer at every theater. Beer prices are still pretty fair. You get a beer for seven, maybe eight bucks, and they usually have the bigger size you can buy for like 10 or 12 bucks. I'm in for that, yeah. and that seems reasonable. But but uh, eight dollars for a medium Coke, no. Yeah, yeah. It, it depends where you're buying the beer. I know I was. We, me and Elias were at AMC for the Chicago International Film Fest. I thought oh, I'll treat Elias to a beer, and it was at AMC. And it was like, <laughs> 24 hours later. I'm like, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> but that's Good two night. beers, right? So each one was 12, and they're and they're 22 yeah, ounce they beers. Size. So yeah. yeah, that's not. I bad. joke. I joke. Oh, it's bad. Yeah. Good rant, though, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. All right, as we had mentioned, and we've talked about all four interested in the remake of Murder on the Orient Express. So because of the movie coming out, we're playing Murder on the Orient Express cast movie trivia. It has a large cast. Neil, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt go first. There are steals, and if you get hung up on a question, you get one trip to the ER for Elias Rodriguez. He has clues to all the questions. Matt, you go first, brother. Matt. Okay. Question number one over to Matt K. Matt, the last time Michelle Pfeiffer and Johnny Depp worked together was in this 2012 movie that was a television show about a vampire turned movie. I believe, actually, Elias may have mentioned it, uh, Dark Shadows. But I would have known it, guys. I would have known it. They start off easy. They start off easy. One to nothing, Matt K. Question two over to Neil. Neil, Penelope Cruz is working with Johnny Depp for a third time. The two before was... Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean film and this 2001 film about smuggling drugs. Oh boy, was that that was that Blow, a New Line Cinema movie? Yeah, one to one. I like it. Matt, question three. Okay. Willem Dafoe starred as Norman Osborn in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films. Who played his son in those movies? Harry. Um. Look at my shit. Um, I got to come up with his name. Whoa. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> this happens to Matt. It's, like, <laughs> it's a layup because he loves these movies. And I love this guy. <laughs> He's great. How much time does he get? Yeah, yeah, we'll give him another five seconds. It's fun to watch me twist <laughs> on the clock. <laughs> um, Four oh. seconds. Two seconds. James Franco. Wow. Oh, <laughs> we need a clock. Yeah, wow. we do. We need yeah, a clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right up in his face. Right up in the grill. Right here. It's two wow. to one, Matt K. Let's see if everybody can stay perfect. Neil, question four over to you. This Orient Express actress also starred in the films J. Edgar, Jane Eyre, and Notes on a Scandal. I have no idea. I, 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 I'm, I'm, nope. Don't know. <laughs> That is incorrect. Believe it or not, that is incorrect. <laughs> yes. Matt, you got a chance for a steal here. This Orient Express actress also starred in the films J. Edgar. Didn't see it. Jane Eyre. Mm -mm. And Notes on a Scandal. No. Yeah. It's a big strikeout for yeah. all three of those. Uh, Rye, you probably saw all three, right? I did. Notes on a Scandal. Is Was it Francis McDormand? <laughs> <laughs> Looking for Dame Judy Dench. Oh, yeah. Judy Dench in all three. Highly recommend Notes on a Scandal with Kate Blanchett. See how it all Ooh. comes full circle. All right, it's two to one, Matt, and question five is over to him. Matt, what was the name of the movie in which Johnny Depp played mob man Whitey Bulger? Hmm. Hmm. Do you remember this one? Yeah. We reviewed it here on Cinema Jaw. Uh -huh. At least I did. I don't know if you saw that it. clock started yet? I, yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember <laughs> giving away the merch. It was like... Um... Neil's right. We do need a big clock in here, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. That's a good move. 
Ah, man. Un- unbreakable. I don't know. Neil, you got a chance for a steal and to tie it up. Black Mass. <laughs> Wow, that is correct. Black Mass, two to two. I never did catch up with it. Was it good? It's decent. It is. Okay. It's not great. It's not. It's good. It it's is decent. And then that's what I agree with. Yeah. Uh, Depp's performance in it yeah. too. I mean, yeah. he's still got. He's under a lot of makeup, but it's like realistic makeup yeah. this time. But yeah, yeah decent. Uh, two to two. And question six jumps back over to Neil, so he can take a lead here. Neil Penelope Cruz won Best Supporting Actress in 2008 for this Woody Allen-directed film. Oh, yeah. Name it. Oh, um, I know the movie. Uh, I get the titles like... Uh, Is that clock going? It's Christina... <laughs> Christina... <laughs> something in Madrid with her husband movie. <laughs> Christina, Christina, Christina. Um, Marlena Christina Madrid Civil War. You're so close. <laughs> Christina Marlena Christina. Wow. Wow. Matt, you got a chance for a steal here and take the lead. It's two to two. Uh, so Barcelona is the other word, I yes, think. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Neil's helping him out now. Yeah, I want you to get that. <laughs> I, I can't remember how all the words fit together, though. It's like. Christy, Christina, Barcelona, I don't know. What is it? Yeah. Close, close. If we put everything you guys said, somehow yeah. I think we would have had it. We're looking for Vicky Christina, yes. Barcelona. Oh, yeah, yes. Good movie. Hey, great movie. Uh, two to two, uh, two questions left. Matt, question seven over to you. Willem Dafoe was in this 1996 film that won Best Picture and also starred Ralph Fiennes and Kristen Scott Thomas. Name it. This was before he was in Spider-Man, yeah? <laughs> I thought that was his first movie. <laughs> 1996. I'm kidding. Uh, One Best Picture, Rafe Fiennes and Kristen Scott Thomas. Yeah, I should know it right off the top. Best Picture. Hmm. Yeah. Jesus. All right, you know what? What, what? what number is this? Seven. All right, let's 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 go Whoa. to the ER. Trip to the ER, question number seven. Elias Rodriguez, what so was the easy. name this of that so 1996 <laughs> Willem Dafoe film? Come on. Your clue is the alternate title was UK Injured Guy. UK Injured Guy? I hate these pun <laughs> clues. The alternate title was UK Injured Guy. Um... Five seconds. England, a hurt, hurt Englishman? I don't know. Wow. <laughs> wow. Listen to that. Hurt Englishman. Another poster of yes, us. Hurt Englishman. That. What is it? The English patient. <laughs> it's a terrible clue. <laughs> and and edited, edited by Walter Murch, who was the editor of the conversation. Wow. Yes. Did not know that. Yes. Interesting. English patient got a lot of backlash at the time. Did it? I, I remember um, Seinfeld was really popular at the time, and they made fun of going to see it and people yeah. falling asleep at the English patient yeah. and whatnot. Trying hard. But again, when you go and watch that movie, talk about a beautiful film. Yeah. I mean, shot what just gorgeous. Up, though? That's a, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's a good question. Yeah, there you go. Hey, this is, this is big. Neil has the lead, three to two. Last question of the game. He can win it right here or give Matt a chance to tie it up. Neil, Kenneth Branagh, who stars and directs Murder on the Orient Express remake here, starred in the 2011 film My Week with Marilyn, in which this actress played Marilyn Monroe. Michelle Williams? Doesn't even need a damn ER. Wow. Nailed it on a walk-off. Well done. Can I get a handshake here? Neil wins this one, four to two. That one. Good (laughs) job, man. That was really, really well done. Uh, If it came down to a tie, we call it a jawbreaker here. Neil, this question actually would have been over to you. If you're stuck on a 12-hour train ride, who would make a better passenger to talk to, Johnny Depp or Willem Dafoe? Oh, Willem Dafoe. I, I got to give him that one. I wanted to buzz him really bad, but yeah, it's Willem Dafoe. It is Willem Dafoe. Yeah, yeah, that's the right answer. Uh, the real jawbreaker was this. Age of Penelope Cruz, closest to. Matt? I think she's older than me. Uh, 
I, but not much. I, I'll say like 44. Elias, lock him in at 44. Neil, you got a guess? 47. Ooh. Give that one to Matt K. 43. 43. So you <clears> were pretty close there. I yeah. was right in there. I was going to say 42, actually. So Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Neil wins this one. So that was yeah. good stuff. Good trivia. I love how it ends on a good, on a good one. It yeah, was. Yeah. A lot of fun. Brings us to the end of a great jaw here, Matt. How about it, man? Yeah. It happens every week. It's a mystery, isn't it? It is. They always why come I, to an end. Why do I keep coming back? Yeah. we, we got to figure out how we could just keep it going. Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. First and foremost, we got to thank our guest. Neil, thanks for coming on. Cinnamon Jaw, and, and nice to meet you. Awesome. Great to meet you guys. Super fun. This is great stuff. Please have me back. I'd love to come back. We would love to have yeah, you, man. There's it. a lot of stuff we didn't even get to. I yeah, so. and I learned a lot from you guys. It's impressive. I love to see you guys passionate about movie making. It's it's awesome stuff. Well, thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, we also got to thank our sponsors. Yeah, thanks to all the sponsors and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get those sponsors. Absolutely. We also got to thank the best in the biz, Elias Rodriguez. Thanks, folks. And Fish Tank Phil, the man behind the glass. Phil. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And, and keep, keep on John about, about the movies. movies.